I'm Josh King. My lightning demo today is about toast notifications and how they're best when paired with PowerShell 7.1. Although that's not 100% true anymore, as there's been some recent developments which have shaken that up a bit, and we'll have a look at that towards the end of the demo. Now, I'm going to be going through the code at a quick pace today, so if you're keen on getting your hands on the code so you can go through it in, at your own pace, follow me on Twitter, at WindowsNZ, and I'll tweet out a link to the code during Summit. And if you've got any specific questions about the demo, feel free to ping me as well. So the feature we're going to be looking at today is actionable toast notifications. That's where you can get PowerShell to take action, or run some code, in response to a user interacting with a toast notification. The specific example we're going to wire up here are notifications from a fake chat app. So we're going to have text saying, hey, um, notification came from uh, this person, here's what they said, and give the user an opportunity to reply to the message right within the toast. Now, at the moment, this is only possible in PowerShell 7.1 and I'm using Burnt Toast version 0.8.5, which enables this functionality within it. So, I'm using a couple of icons here just to drive home our uh, pretend use case, the chat app. And we'll start with a couple of lines of text. The first one's a heading, which tells us who the message is from. The second one is the contents of the message the user sent us. Next, we've got a app logo override. This shows on the left-hand side of the toast, and I'm using a chat icon which represents our fake chat app. And just to drive the scenario home, we've also got some attribution text, which says that the toast notification has come via PowerChat, which is our creative name for the fake chat app that we're uh, working with. We take everything we've just created, and combine that into a binding object. Then we take that binding object and create a visual object. Um, all this is is mimicking the schema of the XML behind the scenes. A uh, future version of Burnt Toast is going to simplify this stuff dramatically. Um, even I have to uh, think about the order that all of these various components go on to this day. So next, we create a text box. This is what allows the user to reply to the message. And we put in some placeholder text to guide them towards um, typing in their reply. Then we give it an ID. This allows us to tie components together, which we'll see when we create our button. So our button is going to show as an image, and we're using a reply icon just to drive home the point to the user that clicking this button will reply to the message. Um, once we've created our button though, we need to give it the ID of the text box that we want it to associate with. Um, this makes it display next to the text box rather than underneath at the bottom of the toast like a button normally would. Then armed with those interactive elements, the text box and the button, we create an actions object. And we combine that with our visual object to create the actual content of our toast, finally. So at this point, we could just send this through to the operating system and it would show a toast. But first, we actually need to do the bit that makes these toasts actionable. Um, and so what we'll do is create the script block that we want to run whenever our toast is activated. Um, and I'm just going to assign this script block into a variable. And the first thing I'm going to do is some validation on the uh, what triggered the, the event to fire. So first I want to check the user input to make sure that it's not an empty string, because obviously that means the user hasn't actually replied to the message. Next I'm checking the arguments to see if it equals reply. That argument is coming from the button. As you can see, we've got arguments reply. The thought there being... I only want to fire this code if the user has explicitly clicked the reply button. If the user clicked the body of the notification, it will still fire an activated event, but I don't want to count that as replying to the message. So assuming everything there passes, we're then going to create a string, just gathering some information that we've got, which 
here is the uh, time that the user responded and what they responded with. We're just saving that into a string and then outputting it to the console. We're doing that just to demonstrate that the event fired, that we could get content out from the toast. Um, but the reality is this is just PowerShell code. You could put anything you wanted in here. You could log the response. You could trigger another PowerShell script. You could actually fully build this out and create your own PowerShell-based chat app, which pings messages back and forth between two different users on your network. Um, it'd be work, but it's possible. So finally, we submit our notification with the content and our um, script block. There is also a dismissed action, but we are only worried about the dismissed action for this demo. So if I take all of that and run it, we get our notification. So we can see we've got the icon that we uh, chose, two lines of text. So we've got a message from Mr. Judd saying, hey, he loves Ignite, but Summit's the best, and it's from PowerChat. So we can go ahead as the user and type our response. And then we can click the reply button. And when I do that, a warning pops up on the console. So sweet, our event's triggered. Um, and of course, I can click enter to get my console back. So in there, I can see when the user responded and what they responded with. So that's PowerShell 7.1. We can quickly jump over to the ISE and we'll show how we can get the same end result in 7.1. Now this relies on the version 7 of the Microsoft Toolkit, um, which is brand new, but it enables a hell of a lot more um, PowerShell versions to actually use these actionable toasts. Um, so we need to grab that DLL, um, Burnt Toast ships with this DLL, but this version is newer than what's currently available, um, and it changes a lot. Now, what's different here is instead of creating a script block and providing it when we send the toast, we register it session-wide, our events. Um, so we're going to do that first, and what we have to use is a compatible notification manager, and we register an object event against it, specifically on activated. And the content of our action looks remarkably similar, except you'll notice there's no index on source hugs like there was before. An argument is now singular, it used to be arguments. Um, but armed with that, we can now output our warning. So we need to create our toast very quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, we create a toast content builder object and we start calling methods on it. So we've got add text. Boom, boom, add, lap, app, add app logo, add attribution text, add input box, add a button, which we create as another object. All of this information is the same as what we provided in the previous example. And then we finally show it. So if I go ahead and run all of this, we get our notification. It looks exactly the same, except it's being sent from the ISC this time. And I can type my reply and I get my event fired in Windows PowerShell. Sweet. Now obviously that's very .NET-y and not user friendly. Um, so I wanted to quickly show what the next version of Burnt Toast might look like. It's still a work in progress and I can't actually run this part of the demo. So we're gonna have a register BT event. Uh, it's going to be activated and we can quickly check the arguments, which means we don't need to check that bit in our script block. But the rest of it looks the same. Then we create our builder and we pipe it to add BT text, which we pipe to add B, uh, app logo, then attribution. And this all starts looking very powershell -y compared to above. But the end result should be a nice actionable toast notification so i'm very much out of time ping me at windows nz if you've got any questions follow me to see the tweet where i'll send out the code uh, thanks for watching
Hey folks, welcome to the Lightning Demo Power Up Your PowerShell Experience. My name is Andrew Campbell. I'm a DevOps architect at SoftChoice, where we help customers be, uh, be successful in their own organizations by adopting DevOps tools and processes. Um, feel free if you'd like to connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn, check out my blog. Uh, for this session for Power Up Your PowerShell Experience, what we're talking about doing is setting up the Windows Terminal and starting to add some, uh, some more kind of uh, experience improvements where we're going to add some theming, some Git status integration, and some some icons. So at the end of the session, your terminal or your shell should look something like this screenshot that we've got here. So let's jump in. So I've got the Windows PowerShell on this machine. Um, we're going to use this to install PowerShell Core and the Microsoft Windows Terminal. Um, I have Chocolatey loaded on this system. That's what I prefer to prefer to use to install Windows packages. So I'm going to run uh, Chaco install PowerShell core and Microsoft Windows terminal. Let that start installing in the background. You don't have to use Chocolatey. You can use whatever, um, whatever tool you prefer. Maybe you want to just go to GitHub and grab the releases directly. While that's running, we're going to jump out to a website called nerdfonts.com. And nerd fonts is essentially a, a collection of fonts that have been patched or have had other icons or glyphs included into that font. Uh, so we need to download one of these and get Windows Terminal set up to use this font. So when we start utilizing some of those other modules, uh, they're going to leverage the icons that are within these fonts. Um, so I prefer, I've been using the, the font called Hack on the, the, the nerd fonts site here. So just download this zip file. And when this opens up, what we want to grab is this last file that's in here, the Windows complete or complete Windows compatible font. I'm going to drag this out to my desktop where then I can just right click on the font and do install for all users. And we're going to need to know the name of the font very specifically when we go to set up our Windows terminal. So if we go into uh, the control panel, Windows settings, look at fonts, and we just, I can just search for hack in here. You can see the name of this is hack space NF. So we'll make a note of that. We're gonna need that in the next step here. I'm gonna go ahead and launch Windows terminal. And you can see this is gonna start with the PowerShell core that we just installed. And the first thing that we're gonna do is adjust the settings for Windows Terminal, <clears throat> set it up to use that hack NF font. So I'm going to click the little drop down at the top of the menu bar and go to settings. This should open up in VS Code here. And under profiles, um, we have different profiles for each of the shells that are available. Uh, what we can also do is utilize the default settings that applies the same settings to all of the shells. So which is what we're going to do for this demo. We're going to set our font face to hack and F and to make it a little easier to see. I'm going to adjust my font size to 20 for the demo here. And when we save this, we can see windows terminal in the background automatically reloaded with that new configuration. So now we've got, we're using the hack NF font with a little bit larger size for, uh, for visibility here. So let's get started with installing some of those PowerShell modules. The first one that we're going to install, do install module named oh, posh git and posh git adds some git status integration right into our uh, our shell prompt uh, by itself so once we have that we're going to do import module posh git And then to see what this does, we're going to jump over to a directory that I have uh, on this machine where I've cloned a couple Git repositories. Uh, so if we jump into the Azure Docs repo, we can see the, this section right here is what uh, PoshGit is adding. So we're on the master branch and everything's up to date. If I were to jump over to 
the other repo that I have, we can see I'm uh, on a different branch where a new feature for Key Vault is being built. We've got some files that are um, that are untracked, a file, a couple files that are not yet committed. So we're starting to surface that information right in our um, right in our prompt in PowerShell. So the next uh, module that we're going to install <clears throat> is called Terminal Icons. And terminal icons is going to add some of those um, that colored output to our directory listing and start to add some of those icons um, where it's pulling from that nerd font itself. So if we do import module, and let's see if I jump into different directory here and I run uh, directory listing we can see we're starting to get um, get those icons in line in our output we've uh, the the name of the files are colored based on their file type or their their, their file name itself <clears throat> so next step is we're going to install another module named oh my posh And oh my posh is uh, a theming engine for PowerShell prompts themselves. So it has a couple commands, but one of the ones we'll look at is uh, to get posh themes. And this is going to show all of the themes that are built into oh my posh itself. We can select any one of these so we can see the theme star uh, would give us a prompt that looks like this, where we've got the directory that we're in that gets status integration um, built into our prompt. Uh, the one that I've been using lately that I've uh, that I've liked, we'll do set posh prompt, and we'll use the theme named Powerline. Uh, and now we've got our prompt looking something like this. So as I move around to different directories, we can see that. Uh, whoops. So we can see our, our prompt uh, oh geez. see our prompt changing based on the directory that we're in. So the one thing that we'll notice if we were to come up to Windows Terminal, let's just say we close Windows Terminal and reopen it. Uh, now we're kind of back to that uh, vanilla uh, prompt experience. Um, so I don't want to go through and run import module and set my PowerShell or my uh, my PowerShell prompt theme every time that I open PowerShell, right? So we're gonna rely on something called the PowerShell profile to do that work for us. And the PowerShell profile is just a PowerShell script that exists um, or it is configured uh, to execute a specific PowerShell script on the system that you're on when you start PowerShell itself. So this file does not exist by default. So right now that this, this file doesn't exist on this machine, I'm gonna use VS code, I'm gonna write type code, dollar sign profile. And we're going to start placing all of those commands that we were running on our uh, in our shell itself <clears throat> in our PowerShell profile. So we're importing those modules and we're setting our, our um, oh my posh theme to Powerline. So we're going to go ahead and save this file. Now when we close PowerShell or close the Windows Terminal and relaunch it, we should see it execute that script, uh, which on this took about about a second. Um, and now we've got our modules imported and our uh, our Oh My Posh theme is set to Powerline. So if we jump back into one of our directories here. We can see all that awesome information on our prompt and we've got our colored icons and that will now be our experience with PowerShell every time we open it up. So that wraps up this session. I hope you've enjoyed, uh, enjoyed upgrading your PowerShell experience and have a great summit. Hello, my name is David Shash, and I'm going to do a demo about wrapping snappings into modules. 
I'm going to use a SharePoint server for that, where we have commands like get sp farm and many more. Get sp farm is coming from a snap-in. If I do get command, it's going to tell us that it sources microsoft.sharepoint.powershell and we know that it is not a module because if I do get module, it's not there. If I do get psnapping, we will see that the snapping is indeed there. And we want to wrap this snapping into a module because we want to use standard Windows PowerShell to execute commands like get sp form, which by default throw you a command not found exception because snappings do not support PowerShell's auto this module discovery and auto loading capability. So what we need is a module and I'm going to create that with a new item commandlet. We need a SharePoint.ps M1 file located in the right folder. And that folder in this case is documents windows power documents slash windows powershell slash modules and in that our case it's going to be called SharePoint. And we will need the module manifest as well. It's going to be in the same location, but its file name will end to and as PSD1, and we're going to specify the root module as our PSM1 file. And this is all we need to create those files. If I open the folder, PSM1 is empty, and PSD1 contains everything we need to start. Into the PSM1, we put the add psnapping command and we use this microsoft.sharepoint.powershell name. And we need an error action silently continue just to be on the safe side. And in our PSD1, we need to put all the commandlets coming from this snap in, and we are going to get them um using get command dash module and the name of the snapping i know it's a snapping not a module but it works and if i do a measure we see that we have many commandlets in it let me focus on the first couple of them in the name of the exercise and we only need one property and that's going to be the name property and it should look like as an array because the manifest requires an array of the commandlets for that I usually use convert to JSON because the format of JSON is almost like as an array in PowerShell. We just need to replace the commas with semicolons. And drop this select statement where we do filtering and put it on my clipboard. In the PSD one, we want to specify an array, so that's at and the parentheses. And I'm going to paste everything here and remove the brackets from the end and in the, from the beginning as well. Save it and hopefully if I go back to our previous standard Windows PowerShell where get sp form throw an error originally, it should find our module and 
load the snap in. And if I do a cat command now, we will see that it sources SharePoint and it was able to load our snap in. And now we can use all kinds of SharePoint related commands like get sp site. And that's it. We need two files, psd1, psm1. We need all the commandlets in the psd1. And we need to load the snap-in in the psm1. And with that, we've wrapped a snap-in into a module. That's it. Thank you for watching. Hey everyone, I'm Ryan Bolger and this is Free Certificates in 30 Seconds with Posh Acme. Acme is also known as RFC 8555 and is an open protocol for automated domain validation and certificate issuance. Let's Encrypt is the most popular implementation and provides unlimited certificates for free, including SAN and wildcard certs. Bypass and Zero SSL are two other Acme compatible CAs that offer free certs, though Bypass doesn't currently offer wildcards. Paid CAs like Sectigo and internal CAs like SmallStep and Nexus CM also offer Acme compatibility, and there are a ton of Acme compatible clients and libraries to choose from. Posh Acme is my own client built as a PowerShell module that released about three years ago. You'll need PowerShell 5.1 with .NET 4.7.1 or any version of PowerShell Core, but ideally 6.2 or later, on any supported OS and you can install from PS Gallery. It's great for DNS challenges because it has a ton of plugins for various DNS providers, both cloud and on-prem. Its main limitation is that it only handles obtaining certs rather than some other clients that handle both obtaining and deploying. But there's a companion module that can help with some common deployment functions if you need it. Let's talk about public cert requirements using Acme. You have to own or control a real ICANN recognized domain, which means no corp.local.int and things like that. Proving ownership means being able to create text records in the internet-facing DNS zone or hosting a file on an internet-facing web server the domain points to. All public certs are also submitted to certificate transparency logs, which are searchable by the general public. So if you're using public certs for internal-only hosts, just remember those host names are searchable. With that out of the way, let's get to the demo. I've got the module already installed here as a normal non-admin user. The main function you'll be using is called new PA certificate. It supports a number of parameters that allow you to get a cert with no prior config, including the Acme account setup with the CA. However, I want to show a bit more detail on the process, so we're going to do some of that setup manually instead. The first thing we'll do is set an Acme server with set PA server, and you can use any valid Acme directory URL or one of the shortcuts built into the module like le underscore stage. Starting with the staging server is a good idea to avoid rate limits in production while you're still testing things, but we're going to go straight to prod. The next thing we'll do is create an account with new PA account. We need to accept the TOS and optionally set a contact email address so that the CA can send us expiration warnings uh, you know, when our certs are going to expire. But we'll skip that for this example. Now we're going to choose a validation plugin and learn how to use it. This machine is not internet facing, so we can only use a DNS plugin because an HTTP challenge wouldn't be able to reach it. You can also only use DNS challenges when requesting a wildcard cert. DNS providers vary widely in how their APIs work and how fast they are at propagating changes to the authoritative name servers for a zone. Cloudflare is both fast and fairly simple to set up for API access. So I threw this poshacme.win domain up there and configured an API token already. But how do we use it with the plugin? Get PA plugin by itself will list all of the available plugins and you can also find a list on the project wiki here. You'll notice each one has a link to a usage guide, which usually has instructions on how to generate the credentials you need and how to use them with the plugin. You can also get a quick reference for the plugin parameters with the params switch on get PA plugin. We're going to use this bearer parameter set that takes CF token as a secure string value. 
Plugin parameters are passed to the module as a normal PowerShell hash table. So add the token to a secure string variable and then create a hash table with CF token as the key and our token as the value. Before we try and get the cert, let's make sure the plugin is working with our token using publish challenge. Publish challenge takes the record name without any wildcard labels. So even if you were trying to publish, you know, star.poshacme.win, you would just enter poshacme.win. Then we need a reference to our account. Uh, we need the token value, which in this case is just going to be a dummy value. We need the plugin. We need the plugin args. And we'll throw in verbose for kicks so we can see what's going on. The module adds this Acme challenge prefix, which is what the Acme server will eventually query. And it turns our fake token value and our account key into this key authorization value here, which is the body of the text record. Then we can go over to the Cloudflare interface and refresh, and we should see our record. There we go. Then we'll just come back over here, up arrow, and unpublish the record. And go check to make sure it's gone. No more record. A few plugins also make use of the save challenge function in order to commit changes staged by the publish and unpublish functions. You would normally call it once after all of the published calls and once again after all of the unpublished calls. Cloudflare doesn't need it, but it doesn't hurt to call it anyway just to be safe. All you need is the plugin name and the plugin args. Now that we've made sure the plugin and our credentials are working properly, we should be ready to order the cert. Let's go for the gusto and order a typical wildcard cert. Start with new PA certificate using both poshacme.win and star.poshacme.win. You'll almost always have both because the wildcard name doesn't actually match the root domain. Then add plugin and plugin args. And we're going to add an explicit DNS sleep value of 15 seconds because I know Cloudflare can propagate records that fast. If you leave this out, it will default to two minutes, which is a ballpark estimate for how long the average DNS provider takes to propagate records. Be aware that some providers can take significantly longer though. Throw verbose in there too to show what's going on under the hood. And if we hadn't already configured an Acme server and set up an account, we could also specify a directory URL, such as leprod, and accept the TOS here too. And the module would create the account on demand. But we already did that, so we'll leave them out. And there we go. The object returned is the same as the output from get PA certificate. So let's store it as a variable and take a closer look. You've got the basic cert fields like subject, expiration, uh, thumbprint, and sans. And you've got the paths to all the files that were generated for this cert. All but the PFX files are base64 encoded PEM files, which you can see with get content. Certs aren't imported into the Windows cert store by default. There's an install switch we could have used with new PA certificate that would attempt to import the cert into the local computer's personal store, but it requires elevated permissions we don't currently have. There's also an install PA certificate function with a few more options regarding where and how to import the cert. You may have noticed the lifetime of this cert is only 90 days, which brings up the topic of renewals. Acme technically has no concept of a cert renewal. What clients call a renewal is just a new order using the same parameters as a previous order. The command to use is submit renewal, but if we run it now, nothing happens because we haven't reached the suggested renewal window yet for this cert. You can add the force switch to make it go, but Let's Encrypt caches the domain authorizations we just got for 30 days, so it won't actually have to publish the DNS records again until we revoke them first using get PA order revoke 
FPA authorizations. That's about all we have time for, but you can find me as RM Bolger on GitHub, Twitter, Reddit, and such if you have questions, problems, suggestions, or whatever, really. The wiki has a bunch more in-depth info on using the module, and the Posh Acme Deploy module can also help deploy the certs you get. And even if you're not using my client for your certs, the Let's Encrypt community forums have a ton of friendly folks willing to help with all sorts of Acme-related issues. Thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Robert Simons, and today I'll be talking about the perils of for each object dash parallel. So dash parallel parameter was introduced in PowerShell version 7. It brought run spaces for, for, for the masses, but run spaces aren't something new towards PowerShell. It's actually been around for quite a long time, except the cost of entry for actually implementing it and using it was rather steep. There are some things that you should be aware of regarding this new capability before you use it, though. This is the standard demo that people use to show for each object dash parallel that you've probably seen Jeffrey Snover or Jason Hemlick demoing. <clears throat> I've upped the, the throttle limit to, to, to show the parallelism. Um, normally, the throttle limit is by default set to 5. I've jacked it up to 20, and this should show things working in parallel. So. Looking at the output, you see that we've got non-sequential numbers coming out into the output stream, and that's kind of showing that this is working. Uh, by the way, if you do this with a throttle limit of five, sometimes you don't see the numbers actually coming out of order. It all depends upon what's exactly happening on the computer at the time. So let's add into this by saving the values to, to, to an output file. So I go and declare my output file being in my temp directory, and I'm also increasing the numbers that I'm dealing with from 1 to 20 to 1 to 100. And let's go and run that. Well, that was a wall of red. That did not look very good. Hmm. So that didn't work very well. Let's try that again, except uh, with using the dollar using keyword. So same numbers, 1 through 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 100, and let's go and run that. Okay, no error messages. That's good. So when you're going and talking about variables when you're using the parallel option uh, or, or, or the parameter, objects in, in the pipeline are passed into that run space. However, variables external to this need to be accessed by using the dollar using keyword. This is similar to what you've done with invoke command, except with a big difference. When you're using using with in, invoke command, you're passing a copy of the variable off to the remote execution of that script block. <clears throat> with the parallel uh, option, the actual object reference is passed from one script to, to, to another. As you can imagine, this could get you into some problems if you've got non-thread safe use of that variable in, in different run spaces. <clears throat> so let's go and take a look at what's in the output file. Okay, that looks a little bit strange. Huh. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import the output file. I'm going to cast the input as an integer so I can go and sort on that number instead of trying to do a string sort. Uh, and going and taking a look at this, um, I'm missing numbers here. So why? Well, add content isn't thread safe. And this is a common theme when you're going and talking about uh, doing parallel operations at the same time. Uh, did you notice that we didn't get any error messages about input not getting into the uh, output file that we had? Uh, we have five run spaces that are all trying to write to the same file at roughly the same time. So some of the numbers didn't make it, and they just kind of fell fell on the floor. So I'm just going to clean up that output file and then continue on. So dealing with files in a thread-safe manner gets complicated really quickly. Uh, Fred has an excellent module that handles thread-safe logging called PS Framework. If you're doing any logging in run spaces, I recommend using it. However, if you're more interested in going and seeing what .NET has available as thread, thread safe classes, you can go and see the link below. Uh, regarding variables, this 
example is taken right from the help. And in the help, they say that this is a little bit of a con con kind of contrived um, uh, example that they have. So what I'm going and doing is that I'm going and creating a dictionary object that is thread safe. And then I'm going and getting all the processes on the machine. And then in parallel, I am going and adding in each process name and its uh, PID to uh, the thread safe dictionary object. And then I'm going and finding out what the PID is of the PowerShell version 7's um, shell, shell that I'm running. So let me go and run that. And there you get back the PID, uh, the process name, uh, some information about that process. Now, I was only expecting one of these two to, to retrieve because, again, this is a dictionary object and I'm using a process name. And if I've got multiple different versions of version 7 uh, PowerShell running, I'd only get one of them into the dictionary object. So that's what I'm expecting and that's what came out. <clears throat> so let's move, change focus a little bit and let's go and talk about something that I potentially be doing in production. So I want to run a script against multiple different machines out in the environment to get the last reboot time. And instead of running this in a serial manner, I want to run in a parallel manner so it'll run quicker. So I've got a function here that I've defined uh, that goes out and using sim instance goes and gets the Win32 operating system class and goes and gets the last reboot time from that information. So let me load up my function and let me go and prove that this works by running it against the local machine. And that tells you that I've rebooted this machine relatively recently. And then let me go and attempt to go and run this using for, for each object as parallel. <clears throat> and if you take a look, I'm getting red. And I'm getting red coming back and saying that it doesn't understand the uh, function that I was going and trying to use. So functions don't run in a run space using for each object dash parallel. These run spaces are very lightweight by design. There are hacks out there about loading functions into run spaces, but they're really ugly. Um, there is an open GitHub issue regarding transferring the current environment into the run spaces. You can see that discussion in the link below. So this is one way about getting around it, but it kind of really defeats the purpose of having functions. And, and this is where I'm actually defining the function in each one of the parallel run spaces that I'm running. And does it work? Well, we'll get to find out. So three machines in my input list, I get the three, three, three times that they rebooted. That looks relatively right. So it, it did work, but again, this is not the real purpose of a function. The purpose of a function is to define it once and then use it multiple different times going back to the same, same function. <clears throat> so this workaround is, is using modules. Now there's a couple of things that you should be aware of when using modules, and this is along the same theme of what we've heard about variables and also writing out to files. They need to be thread safe, or, or at least they don't need to be dependent upon other things in the module. So this example works. The module that I made with that easy function up, uh, up top doesn't have any dependencies upon it, and multiple different people can, can be running through the module at the same, at the same time. And as you see, it gives me the same output. So run spaces are powerful additions to your arsenal of running your scripts less in serial and, and more in parallel. But they have some things that you need to be aware of before using them. I look forward to seeing you all when Summit resumes in person. Thank you for listening to me talk about the perils of for each object dash parallel and stay safe. Hey everybody, welcome to PowerShell Summit. My name is Justin Grody, I'm a Microsoft MVP and PowerShell aficionado. I was uh, hoping to see you guys in person this year, show off my beautiful hair that I've been growing, but I uh, guess that's just going to have to wait till next year. Uh, today I'm going to be doing a lightning demo of the BICEP PowerShell module. This module uh, is a front end for the BICEP language, and let's get a little bit into what that is. BICEP is a language that has been developed by Microsoft to provide a much easier way to develop ARM templates and deploy to Azure. It provides a much simpler syntax than the typical ARM template you might work with. And uh, what it does is that it, it builds these ARM 
templates using a technique called transpiling, where you write things in the really nice bicep language, and then when you go to compile the bicep, it transforms it into an ARM template that you're ready to deploy. But if you look at sort of this example of how things are laid out, the examples that are there, are bicep build, AZ deployment create, these are command line tools. And we're PowerShell people, we wanna use PowerShell tools. So let's scratch those out and go over what we're gonna go over today. We're gonna to show off the build bicep command, we're going to show off a little bit about new AZ deployment, which is a uh, standard Azure AZ module command, but it will allow you to deploy now using native uh, BICEP language templates. I'm not going to spend too much time on what BICEP is or how it works, but you can go to aka.ms slash BICEP to do a video, uh, see a video, do some training, uh, walk through some tutorials and get a real good sense for the language in depth. But for here, we're just going to do kind of a quick demo of how this module works. This module is done by a Stefan Avemo. Uh, it's a community module. Uh, it's just very lightly wraps around the bicep uh, assemblies that are used to make the bicep CLI. So don't call Joey for support or anything like that, but it is a uh, really nice standard module to work with bicep templates in PowerShell. So here I have a real simple template. Uh, I have my storage account. I have all these um, uh, sort of parameters that are part of the bicep language, but as you can see it's pretty readable. You know, we have our storage account, we have our type, and we have all these nice auto-completing types to grab what we want to get. The name, where it's located, I'm just going to use the resource group, what kind of module, what kind of storage account it is, and uh, what the SKU is for it. Real simple, much easier to read than if you've ever seen an ARM template like this. You know, it gets a little more verbose, a lot more JSON-y, um, you know, where you get a little bit cleaner here. So now that we have this, let's go ahead and fetch our bicep module. So to use that, it is on the PowerShell gallery. So you can just do uh, install dash module bicep, and that will fetch it and install it. I've already done that, so we'll just skip that part for now. Let's go ahead and explore this module a little bit. As you can see here, we have a few different functions. We got a build bicep, convert to bicep, get stuff about the bicep versions, and then some commands that if you really want to use the CLI, some commands for managing, installing, and updating the bicep CLI, uh, as some tools you have may need them. But we have all these nice kind of easy ways to work with biceps. So let's look a little bit at the build bicep tool. I'm going to do help build dash bicep, show window, get myself a nice little pop-up here that will kind of go into it. And we can see it has kind of a typical help file and we can uh, do a build bicep. We can look at our parameters and we can um, uh, specify where our bicep file is, output it, exclude it, all that typical stuff. You can explore it. We'll explore some of these options real quick. So let's just start with easy. Let's do build bicep. And you see that I automatically found that bicep file that I had in my folder and spit it out as a JSON file if you were looking very closely in the corner there. And now I have this nice little uh, JSON file that is my ARM template. And you can see it's that same storage account, the same information, but including all the additional information. So that's great. We got a real simple tool to uh, construct bicep, but we can do more with it. If we want to view that same template, we can do it as a string and get it as a string and import that where we need to. Or we can also do it as a hash table. And where the as hash table comes in handy is when you are deploying in um, using the AZ deployment tool, it accepts a hash table object as well as a string object, as well as the template itself for deployment. So you can do all kinds of things like do some PowerShell work to adjust the template and uh, say maybe, maybe change the name before sending it on to the deployment command. All right, so now that we've gone through a couple different ways to use bicep, let's go ahead and see what kind of what more we can do with that now that we know how this build bicep command works. Here I have a simple script. That's simple. We start with that thing that we did before. Where we take the template of the build bicep, we get as a hash table. And now if we look at it, we can see that object and that's a hash table and it's just that same ARM template format now. And because it's a hash table, we can manipulate however we want. So currently we have a template dot resources dot name when the bracket zero just means the first resource okay that's that my neat storage account as you saw in the previous example let's go ahead and adjust that and give it a name bicep takes over now if we look at it now it's got that name okay great now let's go ahead and try deploying our new template that we've made with that additional hash table so it'll take just a second for uh, azure to evaluate and make sure it's good one of the nice things about ARM templates is that they deploy directly against Azure and they check the state directly against Azure. So there's no state file like you get in Terraform and kind of other similar technologies. It's, it's always up to date in that regard. 
And if we look here, we can see here's our deployment and our new name is bicep takes over. So if we needed to do some kind of like quick runtime adjustment to the template before we deploy it, we have all the power of PowerShell to do that while still being able to work with the template in a very nice, simple uh, bicep manner. All right, so we've seen how to kind of utilize the bicep uh, PowerShell module to kind of work into PowerShell scripts and do some kind of nifty manipulation. But what if we already have our ARM templates written and we don't want to go through all the trouble to have to rewrite them into bicep? Well, thankfully, uh, the tool also provides a decompilation tool to convert ARM templates into bicep. So I have here in my folder a uh, Azure deploy and this is a template that's straight from the typical uh, the Azure resource templates for just deploying an Azure function. And so it's got a storage account, it's got a web group, it's got all the kind of typical stuff, website, excuse me, all the typical stuff you would see in an Azure function. And so what we are going to do is we are going to take this and convert it. So here on my command line, I am going to do convert bicep. And so in this folder, I'm going to convert to the path where that JSON is created. And then I want a test output directory. And when I run that, you'll see that it goes through. It lets you know that, hey, this is a best effort process. Sometimes there's little things that come up because while Bicep is supported in production, there are still a couple little niggling bugs that might come across. You'll see here it found one along the way. It's like, hey, this name property and your sort of old template isn't really supported anymore, so you need to clean that up. And if I go to my template here, you'll see I now have this same template in Bicep format. And you'll notice the Bicep automatically warns on that same thing we got the warning for before. And now I have a bicep template that I'll clean up that one little thing. And now I can do deployment using this bicep template, which was originally an ARM template. All right, so let's go ahead and deploy our bicep template that we now have that we converted from the ARM template. You can see we have all the details here for the Azure function, Python in this case, uh, the server farm and the storage account. And you can see over here, we have kind of a nice graphical view with the uh, ARM visualizer extension for VS Code. And let's go ahead and do a deployment. So I'm going to do an AZ resource group deployment using that resource group name, uh, the name of my deployment and the template file and go ahead and run it with a what ifs just so we don't actually create the resources, but know what it's going to create if it would, because uh, that Azure resources get spendy and I ain't got all the cash in the world to burn. So uh, one thing you also notice here is that I specified the bicep file directly as opposed to having to specify an ARM file. That's because the AZ resource group deployment and all the deployment commands now support the bicep format natively. So we can see here, now we have our resource that would be created. We have that storage account, we have the test app, we, and we have the uh, site backing for the function app. So there we took an Azure template, we took it, we converted it to a bicep template. Now we have a bicep template that we can work with, manipulate, add properties, turn into a module, all kinds of things that can be done there. So that's an overview of the Bicep PowerShell module. I hope that uh, gives you some ideas about things you can do with Bicep and how you can integrate PowerShell and Bicep and use them to both build better Bicep templates and deploy them and really get using this really nice new language as a much more human friendly way to define your infrastructure as code and deploy it. Uh, thanks everybody and have a great PowerShell Summit. So hi, my name is Greg Onstadt. This demo is a solution to a problem I saw where people without admin rights to their desktop needed to check out a password out of a password management system and then couldn't see the password to type it in because UAC was kicking in. Uh, so if you don't have that problem, you can probably see some other use cases to help you on your personal systems to not run as admin. Okay, for the first part of the demo, I'm using a system out in Azure. It's a server 2019, but this was working on Windows 10 just as well, uh, just to show some information about the system. I'm logged in with a, I'll show you that. I'm logged in with the user non-admin. You can see it is not in the local administrators group and the group that is an admin has only the sysadmin account in it. And I am in the local remote desktop users group. Um, the UAC policies in question that this is helping with are user account control, 
behavior of the elevation prompt for admins being prompted for consent on the secure desktop and for non standard or for standard users, not admin users to be prompted for the full credentials on the secure desktop. So option one, you can go in, be prompted for a credential, grab it out of another password management system, paste it in, you know, a PowerShell credential object. This command is going to start a PowerShell session with that credential object and using the argument list to start a different PowerShell prompt using the run as command, which will make it as an administrator. So the standard user I have here, non-admin, does not have any rights to run as administrator. If I try to do run as administrator here, it will prompt me for credentials. And if I can't see the password system that holds those, it makes it very difficult to type in a 30 plus character password. So running this command, if you watch closely, you'll notice that I've got different colors for my PowerShell prompts, depending on which user is running them, that it will launch a PowerShell session as a different user, not as an administrator, and then prompt for consent to run the PowerShell session as an administrator. So no, no admin at the first spot. Yes, now I'm an admin. I'm now the sysadmin user. This is now, I can run any commands that I need to run locally that I would require administrative rights for. And I can also use this credential to use PS Remoting and whatever other external tools I might need to use. Taking it a step further, if you have integration with your password management tool, you can just pull the passwords directly into the object and not even have to get prompted. Here I'm using Secret Vault with an Azure Key Vault to store the credentials. So I'm getting the my secret into that, and this is for my DA password. Building the credential object. And I will clear the secret and run another prompt as a different user. Again, it starts off without admin rights and it ends up with admin rights. The difference there being you can use secrets management to get all your information and you can have all your different credentials in memory of your system. Now I've got a DA cred and up here I created um, an admin cred. So both of those credential objects are still in memory. And just to show you can run additional tools besides PowerShell, you can run command prompt, anything else that supports the run as switch. And again, you can do the same thing with the uh, admin cred, I have it out in a key vault as well. Run everything all together, it pulls the credential, launches the administrative prompt. So if you want to see some options, running the administrative cred, which is not a domain admin, these commands should fail because it does not have rights to connect to the domain controller. If I use the DA cred, and paste in those same commands. I can do whatever I need to do external or remotely as well as on the system. Then one other thing, if you're going to be running lots of things on your local system as administrator and you need command line equivalents, uh, in the code for the demo, I've got a lot of the tools you might need to know. They're command line options um, for uninstalling software. There are some PowerShell ways to do that. I did find some items in control panel do not work as expected, like the control uh, configuration manager client. If you run it from, if you only run control panel and then try to run the client from the control panel itself, it will not run as admin. 
If you run it with both commands on your command line, then it runs as admin. There are lots of other weird oddities that I've come across in digging into this. Um, some of the other things that I found and failed along the way, uh, trying to just run PowerShell with the other credential, it will launch a window which you cannot type into. Although those keyboard strokes sometimes come out over here. It was very odd. Um, if you try to use sysadmin versus the NetBio style name or the UPN style name, those will all fail to start the process as well. So those are a few of the things I found as I dug into this. It was not something I could find on Google very easily. I didn't see a lot of other people trying to do it, so I thought I would share. Thanks for your time. Uh, if you'd like copies of the code that I demoed here, the link for my GitHub is on the screen. Feel free to grab it and make it your own. Thanks.